Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blue Star Rising, Templar Awakening. Michael Henry Dunn here with Reverend Maya Nartumid here on the 8th of October in that fabulous, unforgettable year 2020. <laughs> um, hopefully, we will someday look back on it as having been fabulous in the sense that um, there were many necessary revelations and great growth, and uh, we all got through it somehow. And the subject today, uh, the Kachina, the true nature of the Elohim Kachina, uh, might seem to be so high and removed from all the 3D stress that we're all going through right now. But as usual, with Blue Star Rising, <laughs> um, we have been given this fascinating, compelling dichotomy of this very high stream of, of knowledge coming through the Thothic stream that, that Maya shares with us, and very compelling 3D applications, uh, compelling um, a compelling cause and effect consequences of how we receive this material, what we can possibly do with it, and where that might lead for our own consciousness and for the fulfillment of our own contribution to the ascension dynamic. So um, do you want to share with us a little bit more, Maya, about um, the nature of today's theme? Yes, um, it's about world creators, Aka the Kachina Elohim, and the uh, principle, Ascension Principle, which is, of course, Light Principle 40. Uh, in our second video, we'll get a little more into the Light Principle 40 part. But the Kachinas, of course, are the ones who actually... Uh, these kachinas, because I should say that because there are other kinds of kachinas, as I mentioned. So I'm going to say the Elohim of the earth. The Elohim of the earth are the ones who uh, establish the frequency at the right time. It's like a birthing. And when the planet is ready to be birthed into this new frequency, this new vibration, the Elohim are responsive to that. They get the birthing feelings going on, you know? And that is what... And, uh, brings them forth, uh, activates them into what I saw, that streaming energy, and we will hear the humming coming out of the center of the earth. You know, it's not that the Elohim are ah, humming, but it is that they are bringing the energies together in a way that, of course, the whole earth is humming because there's a, a shifting, a changing of energies and frequencies. The sonic field is being changed. Everything is being changed. So, when I saw them, you know, singing ooh, as they were flying in the air, it was a little bit symbolic in the sense that I don't think we're going to see these Elohim flying around singing sing songs. It's not like that. But they are, that, they are part of that, that experience of the earth when she hums and she sings her way into this new birthing of a new world. Well, this connects to um, string theory. Um, in, in quantum physics, which, you know, has become, it's not quite what they would call science and that they can't um, experiment and prove it, but the string theory of, of universal creation is, is holding that there are these vibrating strings at incomprehensibly minute subatomic level that do in fact sing or vibrate, that the, this also connects to, you know, the creation myths of many cultures um, are anchored in the concept of, of song. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien's um, creation mythology behind the Lord of the Rings is, you know, the Ainur sang the universe into being. So uh, this is a beautiful 
correspondence here with with what you're describing. Um, it it also, I, I just want to say up front before we share the video with everyone that the Kachina, which is a Hopi word of, of the Hopi native people in America, in the Southwest particularly, um, you know, we are, are coming to you from Crestone, Colorado, Southern Colorado. And there are, of course, um, the Hopi were here um, they are mostly in uh, northern Mexico, Arizona at this time. And, of course, they were the most peaceful tribe. And the origin of Crestone is, as an interfaith center, is, is another story to tell and share sometime. But a, a prophet, an old white-haired man, came to uh, a large <laughs> landholder here in Crestone about 35 years ago and shared this rainbow Kachina prophecy of the interfaith community that could be a model to the world of sustainability and harmony could come to being here in this sacred valley. And um, the woman to whom this was said, she and her husband, this is Hannah Strong and her husband Maurice, then went to the Hopi Hopi elders after spending several days with this man to verify and say, you know, was there indeed such a prophecy? And so the nature of the special vibrations here in this valley, particularly of Crestone, between the massive aquifer and the crystals that um, lie beneath it, um, came more to light in terms of um, the Hopi's presence here. This was called the Bloodless Valley. And it was not a place where there were permanent settlements because it was recognized as a place of vision quest, uh, of healing. So I just wanted to share with everybody before we begin to, uh, before we share with you this video on the Kachina, that there is this mystical connection between the Hopi and the, the larger Ascension dynamic. Um, so we, we honor the Hopi tradition in its own sovereignty, its own unique expression, and that this is um, what you might describe as a link to a larger um, as Earth Ascension uh, perspective on this. Would, would that be a, a fair description, Maya? Yes, that certainly would, Michael. Yes. All right. Very good. So uh, with that, we will go ahead and, and share with you now this um, um, brief video. Of it. It's about 15 minutes or so. And then we will carry on with an exploration. Please enjoy. From my publication, The Source, in 1987. In meditation, I saw a clearing in a forest where tall green grasses grew. Attached to these grasses were light beings whose forms were genie-like in that they had head, upper torso, and arms, but their lower trunk was a swirl of light funneling into an undetermined point. Their hair was like a flame rising from the head. The faces were fairy-formed in that they appeared childlike yet wizened, with a faint oriental turn of the eyes, which, in this scenario, were closed. Their arms were crossed over their chests, and they seemed asleep or in a chrysalis state. The forms began gently weaving, as if stirred by a breeze. This motion slowly increased until they were actually spinning in an easy motion still attached to the grasses. The next night, in that twilight between sleep and waking, I saw beings of the same type again. However, this time they were golden and quite awake. There were thousands of them, their arms out before them, hair or flames streaking as they formed a giant wave 
of golden light. I saw the earth beneath them as they rushed over its surface. Their mouths were open, and they emitted a singing that was one tone in harmony, one vibrant sound that filled me with expectation. Still another day, I was outside meditating with my crystals, allowing the sun and sky to merge within me and fill the empty spaces. In my mind's eye, the beings revealed themselves to me once again. There were several around me. The time had come for them to identify themselves. They did not speak, but communed nonetheless. I was told by them that they were what was known by the Native Americans as Kachinas. They explained that the term Kachina, as applied by the ancient races of America, encompassed two form types of being. One was the people from the other worlds of a high spiritual energy, the ultra-terrestrials. But the majority of Kachina contact, they told me, were the highest of Davic cosmorphic beings on the earth. I knew Devas were nature spirits of all types, and that cosmorphic meant the angelic counterpart in the nature kingdom. Yet the Kachinas are apparently the most advanced of these cosmorphic forms. They have specific functions, at this time being to awaken latent earth energy sources, areas clogged by physical, mental, and spiritual abuse, and to begin regeneration of the ancient calendars or time frames from which we, as a planetary whole, have become separated. In the ancient days, the dwellers of Terra were harmonized to a divine order, balanced in the workings of the cosmic clock. It was a rhythm each sentient human contained, pulsing with his, her genetics, attuning that being to the celestial timepiece of the universe. Because of the many reprogrammings mankind has since submitted to, only a faint ticking of this motion is left within their biology. Although not physical, like our ultra-terrestrial brethren, the David Kachinas were starborn, formed from the particles of the divine living lights, or archangelics, within the star suns. They are the Avahron. In the first stages of Earth's creation, they formed a bonding for light-balanced matter. As seeds or programs of creative potential, these beings were delivered into the center of the Earth. Within the central sonatoma, they germinated, quickening within the womb of the mother. Their birthing was a deliverance of fully formed Abaron into the central cavity of the planet. The Kachina Abaron were the guardians of all light-balanced matter within and on Earth. As they arose to the surface of our world, it was they who were known as the Elohim in the Bible, for they were the co-creators of life forms, in that they brought together the archetypal patternings from the Creator's mind into physical conformity. As ages passed and mankind populated the planet, the Kachinas were forced to withdraw from the surface of the earth maintaining themselves within the more illuminated interior world which they share with the Central Sun tribes. However, even within the sacred hollow, there is only need for a few of the Abaron to be active, as without the dynamics of a complete world, the Abaron cannot serve their purpose of sustaining the light dynamic of this sphere. Thus, most of them are in a chrysalis state, as I saw them in small colonies within the forest lands set aside for them within the inner earth. The Kachina Abrun, who visited me in my crystal meditation, told me that in my second vision I had foreseen the future when they would create a rushing of light as their radiant form swept across the earth, 
changing the frequency of all matter-bonded substance to the radiation of the Creator's light. This would be enacted when the world reached LP40, Light Principle 40, something I have known about for several years, that moment when this planet quantum leaps into another dimension, taking with it those who open their heart chakras to the sounding. I had heard this great and moving harmony in my meditations before, but as the Kachinas communed with me, I realized it was they who would be issuing the sacred clarion. Only a few at this time of these inner earth Kachinas are awakened, but more will follow in select groups or matas. Each mata contains Kachina Abarun of the same patterning, Apparently, there are many different pattern groups, each conforming to a specific doctrine of signature or creation bonding. There are matas that work with the archetypes of the air, others that work with the sea natures, others still that weave the star radiations into the heart of the planet. There is a mata that serves only cetaceans, another that works with the tectonic plates of the earth. There are other devas, both the higher cosmorphous and the lesser spiriti, that work under them, but they, these kachina, are the zenith, or utmost spirit guardians of the nature realm. Now that the kachinas are being awakened, they will begin to reform the nature veil, or etheric imprint of nature, about the planet that has been so torn and mutilated. I do not see all this happening overnight, nor is it occurring slowly. There is a definite urgency to accomplish among them. A dream I had experienced the night I saw the rushing, the waves of singing Abaron, was then interpreted for me by my small group of Kachinas. In the dream, I had been leading a band of seven or eight people through a green countryside. I was taking them toward a great misty cloud that settled low on the land in the distance. As we progressed upon our journey, the landscape changed. It became a dark red earth, barren of all but the fewest shrubs. The sky grew tainted with an orange-red color and we began to hear an almost deafening low roar. As we entered the misty cloud, the land which we were traversing began to wind upward, with only a narrow path to guide us. We now ascended an ominous red mountain or giant rock. Although there was foreboding, there was also a strange sense of belonging and spiritual rapport. As I experienced it, the dream was sending me confusing signals. Somewhere near the summit of this giant boulder, I instructed my band to turn around. I told them we could no longer continue upward, as it would be impossible for us to withstand the increasing sound. We must retreat and prepare further for this mission before returning. Thus, we headed back down the Martian-like mound with some difficulty. The Kachinas told me that I had been seeing into the future when the dimensions of the world began to shift and, as in the past, various interdimensional portals would open wide as they did in the time of Avalon. Only in the future, in the future age, this would occur to a greater extreme. The sound we heard was not demonic but merely the inrush of vibration as these dimensions separated their bonding. The location was Australia, and it was Ayers Rock, or Uluru, we were attempting to ascend. Uluru will be one of the main locations where a portal will exist between dimensions specifically for souls of this earth to pass through during LP-40. When the LP-40 shift occurs, the dimensional splitting will take place, and there will be on one side the world of destruction and catastrophe, and on the other a world of new birth. The band of people with me 
were those on the New Earth side, attempting to rescue some souls who had changed their destructive course at the eleventh hour. They were attempting to cross through, but without the aid of our plus polarity to ground their charge, they would not be able to accomplish this goal. I turned the band around when I realized we had not come prepared. We ourselves could not withstand the tremendous discrepancy between the vibrations of these two world poles, evidenced in the roaring of the ethers. The message was that we need to prepare through soul work and meditation so that our etheric bodies will be strong enough to endure the enormous strains of this splitting, not only for ourselves, but for the weaker embodied that we must not fail to help across in that last hour. And so now we come to 2020. And as I look back to the 1987 transmissions and experiences with the Elohim Kachina, I see much more to the story. First of all, I realize now that these Kachina, these Elohim, are not the only Elohim in the universe. Uh, these are the ones that specifically went into or dived into the central sonatoma and then were positioned into the terrestrial world within to guard, to guide it, to develop it. Now, there are other Elohim working with this planet, but these are the ones that are, you might say, up close and personal with us. And these are the ones that are part of what the Hopi have called Kachina through the eons of time. In addition, I have been shown that the uh, Avaron or the Kachina, um, they are not in just one form. As I saw them, you know, with the flaming hair and the, the flaming lower part of the body, I call it flaming, shining flames. Uh, I remember how I saw it. But they can uh, and do transform into a more human vehicle. That is, they're not flaming and they have a lower part of the body. And they use a period of time when they're in that form. Some of them do. Remember, we have the Mata. The Mata are groups, and the groups have different jobs. So one of the Mata has the job of gardening and guardianing all of the Kachina in their fields, in their sleeping chrysalises of light. So these Mata will go through cycles, and they will become more formed from the waist down and less fiery, and they will have a body that works for them in the interior. They will be able to speak and uh, commune with the inner earth beings. But they are very singular in that they don't eat, uh, not directly. They seem they have teeth and everything, but they seem to uh, they seem to live mostly on light. I think there's some um, vegetable substance that they consume during that time but they don't really eat regularly like we would think of people doing, not even as the inner earthers do. They, um, they have a customs, and they're not too ritualized, but they do have a way of being and doing, and exactly how they guardian the other kachinas, how they take care of them, I'm not exactly sure, but most of the kachina that are in the chrysalis state are not awake, and when they are awake, it's sort of a dreamy time awake um, and for the work that they do. So I can only say that these particular mata are more earth-like and can commune and do commune. And this, these are the ones in that form who most especially appeared to the Hopi eons ago. So the question would be, can we commune with these beings in either form or one form or the other? I'm receiving that we can, uh, most especially in the more human-like form, although in higher states of illumination, one can touch into the fiery chrysalis as well. 
And so in conclusion here, we must realize how many dimensions there are to what we call the earth and even, of course, even more, the cosmos. But we are connected intimately to all these realms. All right, welcome back, everyone. So, Maya, I found the end, the ending of, of this video, you know, particularly compelling uh, in terms of once the two realities have, in fact, separated or almost uh, completely separate, that there is this role to be fulfilled by those who have, have chosen to serve in this way. This is reflected in your dream, all right? Yes. yes Where um, you're ascending this, this majestic rock, um, holy place in, in Australia, and hearing the overpowering rumble, the increasingly enormous sound of this overpowering rumble of of the, you know, the, the vibratory uh, consequence of, of the separation of realms that you recognized that it was becoming too overwhelming for you and, and that group of souls to be able to deal with and absorb such that you could actually fulfill your mission of helping souls across who at the 11th hour had said, Oops, wait a minute, hang on, change my mind. Don't think I want another 13,000 years of painful karma. Can I come with you guys? <laughs> right. Um, such that you would not be able to perform that mission because you were not sufficiently prepared spiritually, that you're, you had not raised your frequency sufficiently high or you know, had simply done enough soul preparation to be able to withstand this, um, you know, the just primordial power being generated by this uh, separation of the realms. And I know I'm sort of leaping ahead a little bit in terms of like, the, you know, the nature of the Kachina as the creators, as the, the sort of creative emissaries from divinity, from God, um, to actually bring the the cosmos into manifestation, particularly, you know, with the central sonotoma of this unique earth into its full manifestation. But um, you know me, I, I like to leap ahead to, okay, what's the job? How do we do this thing here? Right. So this is the part of it that that most um pulled me in. And so um but I just I, I just put that out there, you know, we'll jump in wherever you you feel um, prompted to? Well, for, first of all, I had told basically that dream story before on this show, and I got it backwards. See, it's been a long time, right? And I was thinking mm -hmm. of it from memory, and with my dyslexia, I got it backwards. <laughs> and that is, I was telling it like, oh, I was, you know, I was leading people across to take them into the new earth, and we had to go back and regroup. But no, no, no. Now I realize, because I read the original material, it was the other way. We were coming back across to get them, and then we had to go back to regroup. So I just wanted to make that correction, because some of you might be going, I thought she said, you know, and I uh -huh. did, but that was because I was doing it from memory and it's been what, you know, 40 years or whatever, 35. So anyway, that's one thing. Um, the other is it wasn't so much that we were badly dis uh, not prepared. Uh, it was that this is a very, this is going to be a very strenuous thing. And there will probably be many attempts, several attempts by groups to cross over, to bring people back and the other way around before it can be accomplished. And at the very last, maybe some of it can't be accomplished because it's so 
the, the veil has rent, so it's just the path is not clear. But my statement after was to say, so it's going to be so hard, so we all really need to get in shape. <laughs> mm. You know, I mean, put it simply, you know, the soul really needs to get in shape the body, and, and to feel, you know, the consciousness of it because it ain't going to be an easy job. If that's part of your, your job, as I've mentioned before, and we'll get into it in a greater detail maybe on some other show, but I have mentioned it before. Another job is for those to, you know, retrieve the planetary genius. And as I spoke about on the show about the planetary genius, and there's probably other jobs, but those are the two that I was privy to from Thoth. They're probably the two main in things that are important in, in the scheme of things that human beings can do as they are, you know, part of this whole process. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, um, this is reminding me of something. This is a little bit of a tangent, but, um, you know, since obviously you and I as souls are involved in this work on, in some level or other, whether we're still around in the body um, when LP40 hits, uh, who knows? But it's, you know, it, it's obviously something deeply personal. It's a powerful dream that you had. And it just, it just came to mind for me that um, back in the year 2000, uh, I was approached by a friend to help complete uh, a screenplay that she and her husband were writing. And um, this is in Los Angeles. And she was um, um, production services coordinator for Universal Studios on the lot there. So she, you know, was um, pretty involved in the industry. And she is now a, a successful film director 20 years later. But um, so the, the, the story of the screenplay was that there's this college campus, and there's this young man with psychic gifts. And he's, you know, like working in the library, but he is pulled into this vortex between worlds. And um, when he tunes into this vortex, it actually has an, a vibratory effect on the earth around the campus such that it creates an earthquake. And of course, there's a girl. He falls in love with the girl. And, and then, you know, the, the girl becomes involved in this, in this effort. They realize that there are trapped souls in this vortex whom it is their job to rescue they can rescue these trapped souls in this vortex. Um, and it's these, you know, goes back to the 1920s, there's a flashback. Um, and ultimately in the climax of the story, um, there is this evil genius guy who's the theater teacher. Uh, so this takes place on the stage of the college campus's theater. And he's, he is commanding the, the darker spirits and keeping these souls trapped. And, but, you know, but it's, it's a hip college campus in the, you know, in the 21st century. So it's got this fine economy to it. But ultimately, there is this climax where the worlds are separating. I mean, and I, I mean, this, they just had this idea. And I ended up writing this whole story because they just had this idea. Well, it's a college campus and they, there's this thing, there's like a vortex thing. And I said, oh, okay, let me write, you know. And so I, I, I just came out with this whole story of, you know, okay, the world is splitting and there's this vortex and there's these souls who are trapped and, there's, and then their job is to rescue them and bring them across. And what ultimately happens, you know, it's, the, he is saying verses from the Tibetan Book of the Dead about surviving through the bardo, going through the bardo and to the other side successfully and not getting trapped on the on the darker side, the chaotic side, but moving through, if they, you know, symbolically to the new earth. And it's taking place and he's reciting the verses and this huge chasm opens up and there's fire spitting up and it's just the orchestra pit, but now it's become the vortex and there's fire spitting up and the girl's <laughs> on one side and he's on the other. And he rescues the girl. Um, yeah, he rescues the girl, but then the vortex snaps shut and She's on the wrong side. Uh oh. And it's too late. <laughs> and she's trapped on the wrong side. And he, the vortex is closed. The moment is gone. And so this was like the opening pilot movie 
of what was planned as a series. And then it's like, hey, I'm well, still hanging out here in the vortex and I'm on the campus, but I'm on the wrong side. And he's trying to communicate with her and other things are happening. <laughs> Anna goes to become a successful 12 episode series, which it never did. But so anyway. You didn't, the, you didn't even get the pilot out? You didn't get no, the pilot? No, I mean, it was a really good script, but I wrote it too fast and too well. And her <laughs> husband was supposed to be the writer and he wasn't as fast. Um, and it was a politically awkward situation where I, I don't want to say anything more about it in case they see, in case they see this. It's unlikely. Um, anyway, the wonderful people, very talented, and they've become very Yeah, but, but that's a but, very yeah. similar. Oh, you know. yeah. I, I, never, I never thought about it and realized it's exactly, you know, what yeah. we're talking about here. That, um, you know, it's... Um, it's going to come to like, you know, the sheep and the goats and the last morning you're going to go, ah, oh, I don't want to be a goat. I'd rather be a sheep. Can I come? <laughs> Can I, you know, pull me across. And when you said there, I think you said just now, you know, that um, it'll take several attempts and we'll do the best we can, but it ain't going to be perfect. And some folks are probably going to get yeah. trapped on the wrong side. Like, well, we'll catch you in 13,000 years or, it, or is it 24,000? I didn't even want to think about it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a lot to it. That, you know, it, it's not quite all that simple. But uh, the bottom line is, I guess, don't wait too long. Remember the message that both gave 2020 about some will wait too long. Some will, they right. will wait to leave them, and some will wait too long. So, oh you know, yeah, and about choice, you know. Yeah, um, free back, will. It's the free will thing, you know. Yeah. Back to the Kachina. Uh, right. I'm going to call them so we can differentiate here. Uh, I want to. I'm just going to call them the the inner Earth El Elohim. It's sort of long, but the Elohim of the inner Earth of the planet Earth. Um, they they're very much they're they're. What do I want to say? It's like Thoth is telling me right now. It's kind of like a they're like a sympathetic nervous system. And and in other words, you know, when you when you hit your finger with, with a hammer, ow, you know, you automatically feel the pain. And, you know, and when you're, you know, outside and the wind's blowing in your hair, you automatically feel the pleasure. It's just, you don't have to think about it. Now I'm going to feel happy or now I'm going to feel pain. You know, it comes into the automatic response system because what is being fed into you, into your senses, into your physical body, your senses, whatever, is going to... Uh, initiate that automatic feeling it's automatic to breathe you know you breathe while you're sleeping so in a way in a way he's saying that the that the um these elohim kachina they are very automatic in that way they automatically respond they um now they automatically respond when they are in their uh sleep or or half sleep state, their dreams, their dreamy state. The only ones that are not quite that way are the ones, the Mata, who have said, okay, we're going to become more human so we can garden. Instead of guardianing, I have to say garden uh, the, the, uh, the fields of the others, you know? And they're a little, they brought themselves in a more, into a more human element. Uh, but the ones that are, you know, waving in the grasses and asleep and they're, you know, they're responding. These are the ones that are responding to us. It's, it's, it's entanglement. It's, you mm. know, quantum entanglement. And when we have feelings, they respond to that. They're, they're, they're picking up on everything that's going on on this planet. God help them. But they're not judging it and they're not intellectualizing it mm. so it can move through them. But what it's doing is it's, they're finding, they're seeking the waveforms, they're seeking the waveforms that allow them to help to, uh, to balance the system. And I know it seems like we ain't got much balance going on here, but we have to look at the holistic picture and the greater picture. And in that picture, this planet would no longer be here. It would be a little cinder floating out in space if it wasn't for things like, like the, the Kachina, not only them, but, you know, their role in, in helping, in, you know, creating that balance. And they can do that because they are, they are automatically 
moving through these weaves. They're not judging. They're not intellectualizing. They're not trying to solve problems. They are simply aligning, aligning automatically. So, um, you know, I read something, I think it was on Facebook. I even posted it the other day. Uh, I can't remember it exactly, but it says that the stars actually respond to to inner energies all over it's like that entanglement so like uh, when we're um, you know having a bad day the stars are actually they're actually responding to it it's ab and, and when i checked it with those he said oh yeah absolutely well that's, so that's I, kind of mind-blowing i mean okay yeah so, like, yeah, because, yeah like here's the thing the stars are light years away so mm -hmm. they're responding what it's you know say 500 light years you know their light is reaching us and it left that star 500 years ago and yet our feelings emotions spiritual evolution whatever is affecting in some way these balls of fire Yes. And as you say, it's not just balls of fire. There, you know, there's this manifestations of consciousness and all that. Um, but you know, the, it's a fact. I mean, of course, then time is relative and doesn't exist in the way that we think of it as existing. Well, yeah, it's quantum, and of course, when you have the theory of entanglement, which isn't a theory, you're entangling with everything there is. So, as I put it on my post, I said, "Oh gosh, I'm going to have to remember this the next time I lose my." <laughs> You get upset, you know, you're going, ah, and the stars are going, oh, God, she's at it again. There she is. Well, I mean, there's, you know, there's 8 billion of us here. And then yeah, you can have, you know, the collective consciousness of of humanity. But what's that thing where, you know, there's 40,000 different um, vibrational frequencies and that, you know, we, we actually affect 40,000 thousand other human beings who share our frequency when I, I forget exactly what it is but but yeah. it's along those lines yeah so for astrologers i mean the stars are not only affecting us so it's some kind of reciprocal deal. well and the yes and the uh the our inner earth kachinas are our world creators that have chosen to be so intimately with us to, that they plunge themselves into the heart of the planet um you know, they are, uh, they are cosmic resonators as well. So they're just literally light bulbs of cosmic resonation, resonating fields that are picking up all of that and they're digesting it and they're, they're weaving it into this song. And without them, we simply would not be able to untangle ourselves from the chaos mm -hmm. and move into the light. They, they're crucial for that assembly. So mm. that's why I wanted to bring them forward in this, um, this show. And when we get to the second part, uh, it's basically, I call it messages from Thoth on LP40. And I found this in the same issue of Temp uh, the Source, yes, 1989 or whatever. 1980, 1990, I don't know, somewhere in there. And um, it was uh, the same issue. And he's, I'm actually interviewing Thoth, and he's talking about, you know, LP40. And so it, it shows the complexity of that function and also uh, the reality of it to me. Um, it brings it closer to a real dynamic. Right. So um, when we talk about light principle 40, LP40, and we've talked about it before, and of course we have the program in which we, you know, go into specifics about what will it be like in reality? What will, what will we experience? How can we facilitate it? How can we move through it? What's it, you know, what, what is the deal here? What is really going on? That, um, this video, this, you know, message from Thoth, you, you open it by, by saying to us, you will most likely not understand this. The first part, just the first part. The, the first part, right. Because it is, um, you know, expressed in 
language necessary to the function of this, you know, most profound, most high, um, you know, inner science of of creation in 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 realms and dynamics and reaches and perspectives that are just outside of the parlance of, of the vocabulary of what even the most well-educated among us are used to, to, to using in, in describing, hey, okay, there's string theory, you know, and there's these vibrating strings across the cosmos, and then there's Einstein and general relativity and, and you know, uh, grand unified theory, and it's like, okay, that's all good, folks. That's kindergarten. <laughs> now, I mean, it, so it is um, daunting. Um, yeah. So before we get, get into it, um, do you want to just um, share on a you know a, a somewhat more basic level um, the the nature of LP forty, the inevitability of it, the the essential dynamic in terms of human destiny and divine design and free will, and then I think so that the high science as we go into it, you know, can, can immediately be related for all of us and for our, our viewers, you know, because uh, here on Blue Star Rising, I think it's fairly safe to say that our viewership is, is not your typical viewership. You know, the, the folks who are tuning in to this program, you know, are, are not necessarily the ones who are going to be tuning in to, Oh, I don't know. I don't want to put anybody down. I mean, I have a wide range of stuff that I like to look at to, you know, let my mind take a little break and look at, you know, Chicago Cubs highlights or Game of Thrones highlights. I'm going to indulge in a little. I'm just spending way too much time up here. I got to, you know, see goofiest plays of the 2020s. But or not with, yeah, I do that too huh? with my own kind of stuff. I do that too with my own kind of stuff. Kitty videos and stuff. Kitty video, right. Yes, the endless, truly infinite. You want to talk about infinity? Let's talk about the infinity of cute cat videos on the web. There's infinity for you. Anyway, so um, do you want to just share with us a little bit about, you know, uh, um, the nature of LP40, you know, on the human level before we leap to the quantum? Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. I hope I'm up to it. <laughs> it's not okay. Easy. I'm sure you um, are. Um, okay, First of all, it's only like the first five minutes that you're going, what, when you listen to this. But after that, it gets a little more understandable. So just hang in there. Um, and we have discussed LP40 before, Light Principle 40, but this is a sort of a different angle. You know, I come across different ways he presents it. And I thought that this was very valuable because it just has this, this really, I thought, uh, in a way, more, even more enlightening angle to it. Um, mm. So, light principle 40. Now, I never ask him what the 40 is about, but we shall, maybe we'll ask him as we go along here. I don't know why, I just didn't. Uh, but. I seem to recall, excuse me for interrupting, that, that Bill Bueller did. Oh, he did. Get specific about why it's LP40. And then he yeah. might have asked you, and you gave him the answer, but might have forgotten yeah, he probably, it. Yeah, he probably did. Yeah, yeah. He asked I mean, you know, knowing Bill, he was not going to just, you know, like, well, there's a 40, and I don't know why it's 40. Wait a second. Why is it 40? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, he is a U.S. Naval commander. We don't leave these details. Oh, but I thought it was LP39. Sorry. Do you remember what, what he said? Of course not. <laughs> Well, okay. I mean, Bill's so, material was, you know. Yeah, yeah. I just go, oh my gosh, that was deep. I'll, I'll remember it soon. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, there. first of all, bear in mind when you hear this, what was it written? I think 1990, um, that I have had no knowledge about the pyramidus radius matrix. That is basically rather new information that came in about 2015. And when I received that information, because it was so core to everything, I went, 
why did you wait this long to give this to me? I didn't get an answer, but <laughs> so anyway, uh, I did not have that information, which doesn't invalidate what I got, but it just, you know, it would be nice if I'd gotten that too. So back to the topic, um, light principle 40 first has to resonate within the light, the mere pyramidus radius platform. It has to establish, it has to have a platform to operate upon. In other words, it's got to have, you know, something solid. It, it can't just go poof and suddenly it's there. There has to be some kind of a, a resonating table uh, for it to activate on. And in that table, that energy table, human beings, souls have to have a, a resonance field. So they're going to be inside it. So many souls that are, you know, waiting to move forward. And so... When that starts, when LP40, there's, there's the moment of transfer when everything just fries. We already know about that. But, and, and we go on from there. But before then, really, you can expand the whole, the whole process of LP40 to include the, the, you know, the stages of events that lead up to that, that, that are really close to that event. They're so close to it, they're almost there. And so you can see it as a... Um, a change of vibration that is entirely based on the uh, qualification of spiritual energy within the individual. What is spiritual energy? It's that state of consciousness that resides just above the physical energy state, but it influences it and connects to it. So you have, you have two things going on. You have the energy of that, that, that awareness and that relativity of your own soulness. But what stimulates that? Well, first of all, there is the fact that you've already been cultivated within this, this domain of energy, of, of field called pyramidus radius. But actually, even within that, what is bringing that about, Thoth is showing me right now, it's like, Okay, you know, like when you get near static electricity and your hair flies up, you know, and you can feel it. You can feel pricklies, you know, as your hair on your arm stand up, you, you feel it, you know, like that. Well, when we have solar forcing that, that reaches a certain stage and, and there's all kinds of things going to go on on a cosmic level, it's going to cause that, let's call it just, you know, just symbolically that static electricity. It is an electrical field after all, and it's going to start getting ready to change. And when it does, then souls who have been cultivated spiritually, they've cultivated themselves and they have helped to do that in the pyramidus radius vibrational spectrum, they're going to suddenly go, ooh, now I see, now I feel it, now I know it because it's coming right at me. It's a physical dynamic. It's coming out of the solar wind. It's coming out of the expression of the cosmos. The cosmos is reaching out and it's embracing me and it's visceral. It's not like, oh, I can see it up there in the distance. No, it's visceral. It comes into the body. Now, if you have that for preparation so that your spiritual awareness can meet it in the sky, as the Bible says, but Jesus meeting us in the sky, as you can meet it in that way, then what happens is this whole incredible experience of transformation goes on. And that's when the moment of LP40 starts activating that transformation in your being. It'll be a little scary, but you know, not really because it'll be so revelatory that you will be in ecstasy. However, those people who are chosen not to be prepared for that, you know, that's not the story that they're going to wind up with because it is a physical transformation. Wow. Well, yeah, this just puts me in mind of so many things. One thing in particular that I want to mention before I forget, we were talking about why 40, why light principle 40. And we mentioned Bill Bueller and that, that I seem to remember uh, one little detail that floats to mind, and maybe this will spark you on this. Okay. is that Bill, and, and by the way, for everyone, we're referring to um, Reverend William uh, S. Bueller, U.S. Navy commander, retired, uh, ordained uh, priest in liberal Catholic church, who um, was a 
founder, is a co-founder of the Sacred Academy um, of Global Evolution here in Crestone, um, and who passed away um, in August of, of 2018. And we, we miss you, Bill, but we know you're with us. And um, he and his partner, uh, Dame Edie Cooper, uh, I say Dame because um, both Bill and Edie um, were um, formerly uh, Templars of the um, Johanni Templar order. Anyway, that Bill said at some point, and regarding LP40, what there were, there were these quarter million year cycles, mm -hmm. 250,000 year cycles, mm -hmm. which would each come to a specific point of fruition, but would not ultimately be the transformative light principle dynamic until it reached the 40th cycle. Yeah, I remember that now. He was working with crop circles and he asked, he had his theory, of course, you know, he all calls it theories because, you know, he says, well, I never receive anything. And of course he received a heck of a lot. But anyway, yeah. he offered it to Thoth about these cycles and Thoth concurred with that. And, um, and that, you know, so it was Bill that offered it up to Thoth and said, well, how about this, blah, blah, you know, and he told about these cycles and he was getting this because he was, he was interested in this particular crop circle and he felt that it displayed that. And I can't even remember the name of the crop circle now. But um, so anyway, yes. And, and actually, Thoth gave him some additional information. He didn't just shake his head and say, yeah, that's right. He gave him some additional information. I don't remember what it is. I'll try to look that up. I think I have it somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, part of the um, legacy and purpose of, of SAGE, of the Sacred Academy, is to, um, you know, preserve and archive um, all of your material, of course, that vast library, as, as well as um, Bill's work. So, uh, And if you choose to help us <laughs> with this wonderful work, don't forget the donate button, uh, which you'll find uh, below this video. And thank you for whatever you're able to give. It's much appreciated. Um, so with that, are we ready to um, to see the... Yeah. Our next video. And do you want to just explain uh, a little bit before we see it what the specifics of, of this Thoth message about LP40 are? Well, I'm just asking him questions and, um, you know, about LP40. Basically, that's what it is. And he just comes up with some interesting things. <laughs> okay. All right. So with that, um, we will now share with you... Um, so it's a message. This is essentially an interview with the very high being that is the source of the Thoth extreme that Maya has been receiving for the last 40 years or so. And uh, so please enjoy. It's about 10 minutes or so, and we'll be right back with you. In 1990, this is a conversation with Thoth. The question is asked to define Light Principle 40 or LP40. Now, I warn you, you probably will not understand this. A delineation of the whole constant or time creation, which can be pictured as a sphere, its greatest density on the surface rather than at its center. Time, or the electromagnetic fields that perpetuate its illusion, are as a whole dynamic. There are a sequence of light mathematics that equate to this wholeness, which registers entirely in the now. When the time creation sphere is divided through sentient entropy, the missing fractions are replaced by logic synthesis. This is a process of higher intellect which will create informal reality where division cannot be equated as with the whole dynamic of the time creation sphere. It is a memory of the missing fraction. LP40 is the light mathematical moment when the logic synthesis finds its constant, i.e. the missing fraction, and reclaims the true principle of its equation. 
And so now Thoth continues, and it's a little more understandable at this point. At least it seems to be for me. When LP40 occurs, an alignment of the joining of the logic and the planetary logos will set up a harmonic at the center of the planet, moving upward and gathering force on the surface of the earth, on its shell. This will create a powerful electric current that will cause the earth to jump from its frequency pattern, hertz, to a much higher field of resonance. Understand that it will not escalate, but skip from one field to another. This will create a tremendous power surge through the crystalline grid of the earth and literally electrocute all those living things not in synchronization with the highest bands of the standard frequency at the time. Most animals and plants will by then, most are now, be within that range. Only 20 to 40 percent of the population will be in the, that range at the appointed moment. I'm going to pause from my reading for a moment. This 20 to 40 percent, which I've been aware of him saying several times through the years, all of a sudden changed. In the last few years, he started to say most of the population. So I go back to him and I say, what's this about, Thoth, because you've been saying 20 to 40, and now you're saying most. And he explained to me that we've literally changed our timeline uh, projection so extremely since this was written in 1990. Actually, I don't know that he said anything about it past then. Perhaps he has, but let's say in the last 10 years um, that um, we have been given more uh, opportunity to receive this frequency. Now, what does that really mean? I, it's not something I wish to go into here, but suffice to say that whereas in the past only 20 to 40 percent of the planet really would be able to reach that, that peak, he's saying now that that's changed. And you can call it a dispensation, but actually it's more just pure science. So to continue with the reading, he's saying these individuals who have, um, you know, will move into this LP40 frequency will not be chosen by omnipotence, but their own way of life and thinking. They will ascend into the new earth star with an electrical leap of faith. The remaining whose faith in their own God self is not sustainable with this fusion will be dissembled at the atomic level. Their souls will go through a reprogramming and they will enter a lower realm in order to rebuild their light bodies. Now I wish to pause again in the reading to say um, that, you know, I have more information on all of this since, I, since 1990. And one of the things I've come to understand is there will be a certain amount of people who are sort of betwixt in between. They aren't in the lowest of the frequency uh, to be dissembled, but they aren't in the higher frequency to literally be uh, sustained through that electromagnetic shifting. So those souls, those in their incarnated bodies, will be transported via light macabre, spaceships, whatever you want to call them, um, to other worlds. There won't be a huge amount of those souls, but they will be uh, taken off planet. I used to feel that no one would be. I, that was my assumption because I didn't understand this in-between point. So um, I wanted to place that here at this time. So to continue with the 1990 text of those uh, statements, and so now in the 1990 discussion with Thoth, he speaks about pre-LP40. That would be now. This period was entered in 1993. Well, he's giving a particular, you know, time frame to look at it. Um, so we're going to look at 1993 through uh, to getting toward the end of 2020 as I make this video. The planet will experience violent 
physical changes, but these cataclysms will be, can be minimized through synergy and prayer groups. Nevertheless, it will still be a time of crisis, as there is much to clear away. There will be more people aware that physical might and mental stamina alone cannot prevail. Individuals will come together in small groups to create plateaus of light above the churning seas and rumbling earth. These plateaus are the Taya, T-A-Y-A, the golden sections deeded to humanity through angelic covenant. Well, the Taya is a large topic, and I'm not going to go into it here, but I'll simply say that these are the land areas which will, their their coding will be part of the New Earth Star Ascension. They will ascend into the New Earth Star, not the rocks and the trees, but the codes of light. And so he's saying during this, this pre-LP40 period, these plateaus will be um, cultivated, shall we say, by human consciousness and spirituality. And then he speaks about the post-LP40, meaning within the new earth. This will be a time of regrowth for a new earth star. The land will still be identifiable, more or less as it was landmass-wise, just before the ascension, but much else will be changed. The air will be exquisitely pure. It will take some time to adjust to the inflow of oxygenation of the brain. The new earth star will be a new heaven and earth, but it will not be devoid of the right to air. Those souls embodied in the new world will have a new dispensation. It will be their keeping once again to not fall from grace. Thoth is then asked, what are the immediate steps needed to begin? Well, this would have been in 1990. And his answer is, pray, be still, and listen, be humble. Cast out fear. Do not rush where angels fear to tread. Love one another. And now he talks about those like himself of the higher realms that are working with this planet. We are the anointed of the temples of time. We stand upon the thresholds that see in all directions. We read the rhymes of ages. Each grain of sand upon the earth will drop one by one upon the foreheads of mankind before we can be revealed to you in our full mystery. We have risen up through the struggles of eons past amid all manner of human agony and fear. We have seen impaled greater gods upon the spears of lesser men. The words of truth which were uttered before the continents arose from the sea are sacred now only to our lips. For these temples are no more, and the righteous buried within them. And yet, like a single flame consuming a fire, the living sparks of divine mind dwell eternally in the heart seeds of each man and woman through all time and incarnation. We do not fear the slightest dark, for we know the sound of darkness. We know also the ageless struggle of good and evil. We do not see denial as the path of victory, nor do we claim arrogance over that which has no form in our dominion. Therefore, in acknowledging sin, we do not create a burden of form, but clarify our intention of light. This concludes the reading of the 1990 message from Thoth. But I wish to further state that what was given then was the path that we are following into the new earth and that the new earth itself is a realm of 
experience which is far beyond what we can even comprehend now, and yet it has a similarity. When he speaks about that we can still err in the new earth, that's true, but it is on a much more subtle level. Because if we've made it that far, we're not going to go down into the mire again. But we will uh, have lessons to learn. Uh, the way these things are um, rectified, such error, is far less dramatic. Uh, the karma, as we like to call it, is is another process. It's not entirely different, but it has a way of sequencing our um, our time continuum to allow us to experience places on that continuum that can give us immediate en enlightenment as to what we're doing that is lesser than and how to correct it. You see, here in this reality, we have no we have no memory of past lives or other realities that we're living. And generally speaking, of course, there are exceptions. <laughs> but um, so when we have this whole sphere that we can delve into, it's going to be so much easier to process things before they get to be too severe. All right, welcome back everyone. So this video, yes, it was arcane and lofty and <clears throat> deep at the same time in the beginning. Um, and yet I was really glad to see how the message really got to the heart of, of how we prepare ourselves and also of the um, you know the evolutionary shift that took place in terms of originally twenty to forty percent uh, of the of humanity <clears throat> was going to be able to make this transition, and now the language is the most of humanity. Okay, whether it's fifty well, percent, huh? The catch is most at the time. How many people are going to be on the planet? Right. <laughs> Most of us who are still on the planet, that could be six of us, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd rather it were six billion, but anyway, we'll see. Um, and that uh, there is also, um, I lost my train of thought a little bit, um, <clears throat> the reality of, of karma mm -hmm. and how we still have free will and we can still err. And yet it is going to be on a, a different dynamic, um, not as drastic, because we will have evolved sufficiently such that when we screw up, or we, you know, it, it's not like <clears throat> we're doing horrific things that uh, involve, you know, dozens if not hundreds of additional lifetimes of karmic expiation. Um, so anyway, this is, um, what, what do you sense where and how did this shift take place such that it's now most of the surviving humanity will be able to make the transition? Did you get any sense of that? Well, as, I, as you ask that question, I'm kind of receiving something right now. And that is with the movement into the 2012. Remember, we all thought 2012, well, we really all thought, because I didn't, but some people did, that, you know, uh, that was it. You know, we're going to go whoosh and everything is going to happen then and all of that. And other people were a little more thoughtful about it. But um, that was a point where there were possibilities. The, 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 the dimension of possibilities expanded exponentially. And uh, for many reasons, we might do a whole show on that sometime, but um, so that <clears throat> he's saying that it allowed 
a higher uh, potential to come into the field. And when this happened, it was basically beyond the reach of certain um, archonic uh, loops. Now, he's going to explain that. An archonic loop, he is saying, is where the archons just develop a loop. You know how we do this. Everybody does this. You get this thought in your mind, especially if it's a worry thought, and you just keep thinking it, and you spin it, and you spin it, and especially in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know, until you just can't take it anymore. Well, that's kind of what they do in, 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 in regard to, um, you know, the... Uh, the patterns, the lower negative patterns of humanity that keep us in their grasp, in its grasp, I should say, because Thoth likes to see it as a cloud that invests in, in, in souls. But um, so it just keeps it in our, you know, it just keeps us. It just keeps us because as long as they can spin that, as long as they can keep looping us around, you know, they've got us. So somehow, all of this led up to this point, and it was an astrological shift, and it was a lot astrological shift that had enough souls on board in consciousness to make that shift, so that a lot of these loops, not all of them, but a lot of them were simply cut. They were broken. And when that happened, it's, it's allowing the, the future, as we call it, to, to be brighter. It's allowing the future to say, oh, well, all these, most of these people now that are, will be incarnated at the time will be able to transfer over. But, you know, we have another part of this that it's, it's difficult to, you know, grasp it all at once. And that is all the souls that are connected to this earth, not just the ones that are incarnated at that time, are going to be involved in this. So what about the souls that are hanging on to this reality in lower astral trapped realms and they have not they're not willing to go into the light so to speak um they're going to have to go through the same process they're not going to have bodies to electrocute but their fields are going to be shattered and they're going to have to move into another they're going to be exercised let's say and they're going to have to move into another level of experience just like the souls that are going to have to be leave their bodies to do it so it's really all the same thing is just a slight difference. One's actually got a physical body at the time and the other doesn't. Now, what about the souls that are ready, you know, that they're, they're, you know, that are there helping and, but they're not embodied. They, they were once, they're going to be among those that are helping people across and whatever. See, it's not because when they move over, when you've translated into the new earth, you can come back with bodies. <laughs> because you've translated that energy through and the souls that have the bodies are bringing those codes those energies of 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 the adam kadmon through the portal the, the the template of man through the portal so that the souls that don't have bodies at the time can reassemble and come back through and and exist you know in this this new uh, template of a form. See, we, we tend to think of bodies as something like, well, gosh, you know, you got to get, first you got to have an embryo and then it grows and then it cells and cells divide and then you birth and then you got all this body to deal with and you got to do this and that. It seems so physical, so real, so permanent in a way, permanent until you buy the farm <laughs> and then it's gone, you know? But the point is, Thoth is making here is that it's not that real. I mean, it's not, I shouldn't say not that real. It's not that that uh, permanent, it's not here like we think it is. You know, there's space between all these cells, you know? So it's like, it's all quantum energy. So when you get into that LP40 field, you're gonna have all this quantum energy just expanding and it's not gonna be that different. Grandma is gonna be standing right in front of you and you'll be able to reach out and touch her, you know? I mean, because it's just, there's not that much difference. We, we've, we've defined it as such, you know, so we keep those shields up. Right. I kind of uh, got off on a tangent, but anyway. No, I, wasn't, I don't think it was a tangent because there were a couple of times in the video, and maybe some of our viewers caught this, where I think, you know, particularly this is a gift of yours where you are bringing in language that is what you might call quantum neologisms, right? That Thoth is 
um, giving us words that approximate as closely as possible, both on a vibrational level and on a semantic, you know, etymological level, um, something that's going to sort of point us towards you know, a, a decent enough pointing finger towards the reality, which is what a word is supposed to be. And one of the words that you were using for when this this wave is coming in, you know, it's solar forcing, NLP40 is triggered, and it's everything else, was that, you know, that our our, our bodies would um, use the word dissemble. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the word you might have been reaching for was disassemble. Uh, yeah, probably so. Yeah, because dissemble... Um, is, is sort of a quaint verb. It's almost Elizabethan, uh, the, the meaning of which is to lie, to deceive, to oh, dissemble. God. It's no, like, no, you no. know, so I could dissemble means to sort of lie in a cunning kind, I'm going to lie without really seeming to lie, uh, is what no, no. to dissemble means. So, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that you were meaning to disassemble. It's almost like, okay, the light constituents of this body, which we think of as so real, you know, um, it just under this pressure it it disassembles it got assembled and then it got disassembled the disassembling yeah, was, instructions for my bookcase say you know this is what well, it, that, it probably i don't know for sure but i was probably right in the text and i just you know my mouth just didn't do it right <laughs> right yeah anyway i'm you know I, I, ordinarily I let things like that pass because it's... No, you know, that's important. That's but but important. That, that was an important one, so I thought I'd just bring it up. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's um, descriptions in... Um, actually, this is, I think, uh, relevant on a couple of levels. In um, the autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, um, there are several descriptions of, you know, an ascended master such as Mahabhata Babaji, um, you know, his disciple, Lahiri Mahashai, gets a telegram to transfer to the Himalayas. He goes there, he gets lost in the mountains, and lo and behold, he meets his guru of previous lifetimes and is awakened and has 10 days of ecstatic bliss. And they think he's lost back at the office. They think he was eaten by tigers, and he comes back, and he, he on his way back, is like, oh, your transfer was a mistake. Yeah, it was a divine mistake. But... Um, on his way back to Benares, Varanasi, as it's now called, um, he's visiting with friends, and one of them says, oh, India has no saints anymore. He says, oh, no, there, there are saints in India. And he, without thinking, he relates this wondrous experience he had in the Himalayas for 10 days, and his guru materialized the golden palace, and he was initiated in the highest kriya, and with the exalted angels and saints and bliss, and... And uh, and he said, "Oh, Lahiri, you, you've just you've gone batty in these mountaineers. You, you know, this is a pity. What's happened to this fine gentleman?" And he says, "No, no, no. If I call him, my guru will appear right here in this room right now." And I said, "Oh, okay. This would be good. Yeah, let's do this." And then he's saying, "Oh, geez, I spoke a little too fast because Babaji had said to him when they parted." You know, my beloved disciple, I will come whenever you need me. So he says, okay, well, you know, I need the room to be quiet. Just go outside the room for a minute. I'm going to need a clean woolen blanket. And he goes into meditation and he humbly calls on Babaji. And Babaji materializes before him and says, my son, do you call me for a trifle? Right? And says, you know, I, I, humble, I humbly beg pardon. I realized my serious error, but it was to create belief in these doubting souls that I endeavored to call you. Given that you've come, will you not stay and speak with my friends? So he says, okay, but in the future, I will come not when you call me always, but only when you need me, right? So anyway, his <laughs> friends come in the door and they're like, oh, God, this is this, here's this glorious avatar seated before them, Mahavatar Babaji himself. And and he's just very casual and natural and says, oh, let's, you know, let's prepare some buttered rice. Let's, you know, let's talk. But then after he blesses them each in turn, they witness the instantaneous dechemicalization de of the constituent light particles of his body. So I realized it was sort of a, a little bit of a long way to go to that story yeah, yeah. but i felt it was it was worth going to it you know as as in a flash in the ether 
He loosened his will from the constituent light particles that manifested as his body. And it strikes me that this is similar to the process you're describing. And also, you know, there are um, places where in, in Yogananda's teachings, he talks about the evolutionary history of this planet and that no people you were saying, oh, the end of the world is coming. No, there are cycles. There are the yugas and souls evolve through to realization in these cycles and the earth does not dissolve. Um, no you know, planet only dissolves when all of its inhabitants either become completely good or completely evil, then the divine loosens its hold. But he says, however, there are within the cycles of the yugas many partial dissolutions of the earth where there is the earth renews itself like a snake shedding a skin. And so this, you know, LP40 and Ascension and all that, that was not Yogananda's purpose. His purpose was to show the hidden unity between the teachings of Bhagavan Krishna in, in the Bhagavad Gita and of, of Jesus in, in the gospels and to give Kriya as the accelerating spiritual technique. Um, but it, it, just as there is this dechemicalization and release of the constituent light particles of our body, so it seems that this is, in a different sense, what is happening with, with the earth itself as, as part of LP40, as, you know, as an um, unavoidable evolutionary event that is coming. It's like, okay, you can't stop delivery in a pregnancy once it started, it's coming. There's a baby coming. So anyway, I was a little bit of a tangent, but I, I thought it worth mentioning in this whole context of disassembly um, and, and the ability of souls who are in the higher astral because they don't happen to be in the body during LP40 or souls who are in the lower astral because you know they're gonna go off to some other lower vibration planet and the souls who have made that evolutionary progress are going to be able to um, have bodies in the new earth. Is that a, yes, how, how is. is this ringing for you? It is. And also Thoth has said to me several times in, in the past when he was first bringing all this up to me, he said, actually, no one will be left behind in the bigger picture. See, we think of time. Oh, it takes so much time. And there's this and this and that. These souls that are having to go down to lower levels and go through that, da, da, da. You know, we think, oh, gosh, how long is that going to take? But you see, from the greater perspective, it's not that long. <laughs> there's no long to it. And those souls will eventually receive their light principle. You know, I mean, so he's saying no souls just are just cast to the winds and they'll never for every eternity ever get out it's just that's not the way it works you know right but i wasn't thinking eternity just thirteen thousand years feels oh, like that would be good yeah, that yeah. feels long to me in terms of like planetary cycle like well you know you didn't make it out with the fall of atlantis uh so you know you're gonna have it's there's gonna be a darker age and there's gonna be you know pain and suffering and ignorance and torture and uh, uh Anyway, sorry you didn't make it this time. Catch you in 13,000 yeah, years. Yeah. Well, the, the, the unique thing about this, there's two things, of course. One is that the light codes of aspects of this planet that have not been tainted, and I don't know exactly how that qualifies. Let's just keep it simple here. Um, they are going to go with us, and that's what reforms the Earth. So the Earth has not dis disintegrated. It is, you know, the major right. part of it is with us but the other thing is it does take a leap in what we call space and it leaves this solar system along with venus and it goes into orion with and rigel becomes its sun and it, it goes inside the sun because that's where the higher world exists. well i don't think you mentioned that's that before it, that's kind I of a big deal oh oh yeah i'm sure i mentioned that before yeah yeah michael i did i did <laughs> okay well i forget things too once in a while. Yeah. You know. um, but yeah, I have in some past shows, but you know, we haven't focused on that. But yeah, it, in fact, you know where it was? It was in the um, video that I put as an insert on the uh, Hespis of Sky. 
Hesperus Ascara on Venus, remember? And it talks about how Venus and Earth, are go the Venus is the guardian of Earth, remember that? And right. the two worlds are going to, with the transfer, the new Earth, they're going back into, into Rigel. That's where they came from. That they aren't a part of the solar system. The, the, I'm not talking about the rocks and the stones, you know, that was created here, but I'm talking about, you know, the, the, the consciousness or whatever you want to call it, the, the logos, maybe. Okay, so, right. and, um, all right, so just for those of us who like to try to integrate 5D and 3D, you go, okay, yeah. the blue star Rigel and the constellation Orion is several hundred light years away, mm -hmm. right? So when we're talking about the new Earth star, it's like physically leaving the solar system to reunite the you know consciousness which originally which originated at Rigel to return yes. there, and yet we're talking about a new Earth star that yes. has a degree of physicality, higher dimensional vibrational. Then <clears throat> something going whoop. Okay, here we are. It's just five hundred like light years away with Rigel. <clears throat> Changes the frequency, but, but as I said, that jump, when it changes the frequency, it's not here anymore. It's there. Boom! It's just not there. It just instantly gone. New period, new place. Well, it's, that's it's, neat. It's, that works. And you know what? It's the portal I, thing. I, yeah, yeah. I, Whatever that I is. Don't have, exactly. I don't have the quote on me, but uh, I, years later, I was thumbing through a, a book somewhere, and um, the scientist was talking about how he. And he was, you know, this was a quantum physicist or something, how he felt that certain stars could literally leap into other dimensions and stuff. And I was going, woo, there it is, you know? So it, it kind of added to what both had told me those years ago. So I know it's a unique thing, but, in a, but you know, um, and also years later, I was reading, you know, I, someone gifted me with the, uh, the Keys of Enoch by Hertog. And they said, wow, he talks a lot like you do. So they gave me this book and I never heard of it before. And uh, I've never read it from cover to cover since. I just open it now and then to see what, you know. Right, cover. right. Um, but in it, it's just filled with, right, with Orion as being the, the central station of light. It doesn't talk about Rigel specifically, but Orion itself, as Thoth does. And, um, you know, and I know that there are people out there that have an idea I don't know exactly how it got circulated that Orion is a negative place and that these reptilians come out of Orion to grab us and eat us all <laughs> or something. But that ain't so, not just according to some. However, to be fair, every, he said everything in the universe has a metatronic and oratronic frequency shift. So you have a metatronic side and you have an oratronic side. So that might figure in somehow. I don't know. But all I know is what he's telling me is that the, the Rigel of the metatronic fire is where we're headed. And that is the dynamic uh, engine for our universe. Now, let me be, state this properly. We think of a universe as being vast and there's space and there's more space and there's stars and there's constellations and we're really little speck down here. This is, I won't call it an illusion. It's not an illusion, but it is a, an aspect of quantum reality that aligns to our limited perception. And when you remove that and you get into the vastness of quantumizing your reality, you realize that the universe is what you what you make of it. The universe is how you perceive it. And so from the perception of the higher ordained majesty, if I may get poetical, um, you know, there Rigel is is the dynamic engine of our reality universe and how it was created and constructed. Now you know, it's hard to grasp because you think, well, what else is there? And then you just go blank <laughs> because, because it's so vast, you know, you just can't get past that. And believe me, I don't want to try to fry my little brain any more than I already have. So I don't go there. But the point is, is that Rigel and, and Orion, let's talk about Orion, is, um, you know, is, a, is a, a, a dynamic realm where there was this, tear, what he calls in the eye of Ra, there's a tear that is moved down through 
Orion. And maybe this is where they got this idea that it was negative or something, but that's not at all true. Um, I, he's never told me exactly how that tear got there, but the process is the healing of this tear brings us into a higher dimension of, of being as a whole, not just us on this planet, but all of the unimanity in this, that we share this reality with on that level, which are other worlds as well. We don't share all of their, uh, our realities together, but that aspect of it, because we're all operating on, on repairing the tear and moving past, and Orion is the gate to take us where? Into the, uh, the atostic universe, which is uh, the non-duality uh, oneness. You know? So that's just way out there. You know, I hardly talk about it too much because there's so much to it. But right now, let's get back to where we are. And we are before, right before here. We do, before we yeah, do, yeah. however, um, I just want to share something that came to mind. Okay. As you were talking, which is that um, this idea of that, this quantum reality, that the world is as we make it, mm -hmm. and that, yes, there is the vastness of space and galaxies beyond galaxies, um, and possibly, you know, universes beyond universes. The science is talking about bubble universes extending into infinity. Um, that this is a construct of of our consciousness that, that yes it has its, its own certain kind of reality but that each soul each one of us um, carries this universe with us as a, as a as a quantum reality that and it reminded me of a quote and i wanted to be sure of the source of the, of the quote. Um, and it turns out to be from the Talmud, which is the authoritative record of rabbinic discussions on Jewish law, Jewish ethics, customs, legends, and stories. And that there is this wonderful saying in the Talmud, um, so that, but man was created alone to teach you that whoever kills one life kills the world entire and whoever saves one life saves the world entire uh you know it, to me that's a, a particularly beautiful um expression of this reality that um each one of us carries the cosmos within us um you're going to speaks of his vision of of samadhi of cosmic consciousness and I um, I perceived the center of the Empyrean as an intuitive point of perception in my heart this was this you know center everywhere circumference nowhere that he carried this cosmic vision as a, a point of intuitive perception in his heart and that just seems to me to be a, a beautiful expression of this quantum reality does it resonate for you Oh, yes, that's beautiful. I never heard that before. Yes, and, and, and another aspect of this that those kind of tapping me on the shoulder about is to understand that what he calls the unimanity, and he also calls it a unimanity pact. He said, well, that's under the unimanity pact. Well, unimanity are the kindred, related, genetically related beings, soul related beings too, that share our universe. Now they don't have the same picture of it that we do. Our picture is far more limited, but than most most of them, I guess you'd say. But um, they have a piece of it that is larger. So he's saying that when the unimanity under the unimanity pact get all of it together, then we have the holistic hologram that allows us to move in through the portal and into the golden star of Missouriel, as he calls it, that is on the lip of the Atosic universe. So, and the Atosic being the, the complete oneness of the whole picture. That's way down the line for us if we want to count it linearly, <laughs> but it is there. So, but when we move into the new earth, we are at a platform where all these beings can come and 
talk to us, share with us, not just, to, you know, some of them already have, I mean, Moses on the Mount and all of this stuff, but those are individuals at times and places, and they had to come down the mountain and say, guess what happened to me? <laughs> you know? But but when we get into the new earth, it's going to be, oh, let's get together with Thoth and Jesus and and Muhammad and you know I mean we're going to be able to come together and these star beings from from uh, uh, Sagittarius that are part of our kindred they're going to come to talk to us today let's let's get in on this you know and this is how this develops this conversation this dialogue this experience maybe it's not even with our mouths maybe it's you know all conscious I don't know but that's what the new earth star is all about it's only one little platform but it's a big one for us because we aren't there yet. <laughs> yeah. I love that, you know, thought that we can um, converse, converse with, commune with, you know, the, the great souls of, of different faith traditions. Reminds me of something uh, that I read somewhere in the yoga writings about, um, well, there's all these petty divisions and sects and, you know, and conflicts about religion and doctrine and dogma. And I mean, even when you get to, like, for example, the island of Iona, beautiful, sacred, holy place, you know, St. Columba comes over from Ireland and says, like, oh, he converts Scotland. And, but, you know, these guys, I said, oh, there's that island over there. Our band of monks is going to get it. No, our band of monks is going to get it. And they've been literally warring with each other, fighting, hitting, killing each other, because that sect over there, they have got the completely wrong notion of what day of the year Easter falls on. We've got the right <laughs> calendar, and we're going to get over there. Okay, we're going to have a contest. Whoever, we're going to have our two best rowers, your best rower in his boat, our best rower in his boat, and whoever gets to that island first gets to start the monastery there. So they go, okay, off we go, and they're rowing, and they're rowing, and they're rowing. And St. Columbus' order is falling behind, and the, the other guy's about to reach the shore. And the guy goes, okay, I got, got to do what I got to do. He cuts off his finger and throws it ahead of the other guy so that he's technically the first one to land. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, no. Right. So, okay. So this, this is how absurd it gets. But, you know, but it makes the point, okay, well, suppose that Jesus and Muhammad and Moses and Lord Buddha and Lord Krishna all gather, you know, in a sacred place and they're going to go, well, you've got the Eightfold Path. You're totally wrong. Goes, well, no, I've got the Ten Commandments. Well, what about the Sermon on the Mount? These, these souls are not going to be quibbling. <laughs> You know, and they're, going these appear, they're going to appear to us in ways that our souls can relate to them at that early stage. I, I need to put this in this little piece in here. There's stages to the newer star, right? There, there's there's stages. The first stage, those calls Numis Om, Om, Numis Om, and I don't know how long that stage lasts, and I don't know what's behind it because you know I can only go so far with all this stuff. So. Um, that Numisome stage is where all the masters come, like we expect them to be, and they talk to us and whatever, and both comes and, you know, all of these. And then, you know, as we get sort of used to that, then the, the beings, the ultra beings are going to be there that we've never seen before in this experience, but they're going to start coming. So it's a whole, you know, it's like a family get together in, in Numisome. And there's more things going on than that, but I'm giving that as a reference. What's behind the next door? Well, it'll still be New Earth, but there's another stage. And then I don't know how many stages, you know, like I said, it's kind of like, don't tell me stuff. I don't think I can handle it all. You know, I just want to know a certain <laughs> what you need to tell me right now. And I'm not trying to flesh in the whole universe here. <laughs> but it's important to understand that. So that's just the first stage of the whole process. Yeah, it reminds me when my mother you know, devout Catholic, but a very, you know, expanded, um, enlightened perspective as both my parents had. When she read the autobiography of a yogi, and, and particularly the chapter called The Resurrection of Sri Yukteswar, which is where Yogananda goes into the nature of the soul and the astral and causal yeah, realms and the three that bodies that, you know, yeah. that, that once we get to the astral, well, you know, there's millenniums of further unfoldment in the astral 
as we work out our astral karma before we shed our astral body of light and energy and ascend into our causal ideational body. And then, you know, okay, then we are simply, you know, an amalgam of divine ideas until, and she was just like, this is too depressing. This is just way too long. This is going to take, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> this is, I mean, I hear, you know, she's raised a good Catholic and, you know, don't go to purgatory, go to mass every Sunday. And then, you know, but she begins to expand into her true soul understanding because she was, a, you know, a, an old soul. But it's kind of like that. It's like, hey, Thoth, you know, okay, we got the pneumosome. We got the next stage. We're on the new earth. We're not making horrible, drastic mistakes like, you know, yeah. but we're still capable of screwing up and slowing down. Yeah, one thing at a time. And the Lord just pulls the carrot a little further, a little further. Come on. Come on. <laughs> you know. Well, exactly. It can get overwhelming. I mean, you know, and then we just sort of feel like, well, give it up. But you have to just be in the now moment. That's why Thoth always says that to me. Everybody says that now, but he used to say it to me a long time ago. Be in the now moment and just, just you know, experience how you feel about your expansion in that moment. You're always expanding, but the now moment is expanding. And when the now moment expands, think how vast those now moment is compared to ours. You know, I'm just thinking. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, uh, right. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. This is Aldous Huxley in the perennial philosophy. He says that uh, the present moment is the only aperture through which we can pass from time into eternity. Yes. This one, right here, right now, you over on Skyview Way, a couple of miles away from me here, you know, me over in Cottonwood Creek, this moment, me sitting here on my couch, you sitting there with the cats and your altars, and this, this, you folks watching on YouTube, this magical moment is your aperture from time to eternity. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Blue Star Rising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right so we that feels like it might be a good wrap-up point for us yeah, yeah. yeah it does yeah. it does okay um can i can i say one little teeny thing here though and go for it um i just want to remind everyone that i do sessions i do skype sessions and if you would like to explore what those sessions are like they're very flexible for the individual, what the individual needs from them. But I also have kind of a, a Thoth guided format that allows for that flexibility. I'm not gonna talk about it all now, but uh, if you wanna get in contact with me about it, please do so. Yes, and I can attest to the great value of those sessions and of, of many of my friends and associates also. And of course, do please like and subscribe if you're able to help us um, continue our work, every little bit goes a long way. There's a donate button there. And um, I think there was one other thing. Oh, yes. I've written a book about, it's a devotional memoir with lots of beautiful stories of, of great souls and saints I've known in my own struggles and stumblings. It's called uh, Romancing the Divine. Um, and those, there's a link to that below if you'd like to read some, uh, some beautiful spiritual stories. So with that, from Blue Star Rising, thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next time. God bless us, everyone. Bye for now, everyone.